So let me start off this lesson with, with a very short story, okay? This may sound somewhat familiar to some of you, um, but uh, imagine imagine um, a young child who goes to church, right? This could be anybody. Um, and, you know, um, the, the preacher gets up every couple every couple weeks and talks about hell and, and how God's going to pour out his wrath on all kinds of people and talks about the destruction that's coming and talks about how, you know, you best repent or you're going to burn and all this stuff. And always talking about um, sin and how it leads to death and all these different things. Always talking about it. Not, not, we're not just talking about telling truth. We're talking about always going on and on about 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 these things and every time that, that they read revelation it's always scare stories so then imagine this person grows up and supposing that they stay in the church which slim but let's just suppose that they do um are then motivated to witness to others but they're not motivated and they're not witnessing out of love they're not witnessing out of hoping that people you know repent they're 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 witnessing out of the fear of their heart and when they witness, they witness out of anger. They're always short-tempered with the person. They're always yelling about doom and this and gloom and all this other stuff. Because somehow, somehow, their endless pleading to the, to the masses is going to, to, to cause people to repent. They, they, a lot of times they see themselves as, oh, I, I, I'm, this is what the prophets did. I'm just doing what the prophets did. Proclaiming the, the coming destruction. And then nobody actually gets saved through that process. And they get more and more antsy and twitchy about it. Because once again, they're motivated by fear. Is that a story that you think you relate to? Would you say that maybe you've been in similar situations? Because I have. Yeah. All growing up, Revelation was the dreaded book. We don't read that book because that one's scary. That's the one that, that people come and, and make us feel real bad about. And you know, we're thinking about all the things that's going to happen in the end times and we're scared to death. And Oh, but it's okay, though, because we're Christians, so we're going to be up in heaven having a good old time while everybody else is rotting and burning. So that's okay with us. <laughs> See what I mean? And uh, just kind of that, that, that real negative um, attitude out of it. I, I know I witnessed for a good majority of my younger life solely out of that fear. Solely out of that fear. I didn't want God to punish me with all them, all those other wicked people. And if I didn't yell loud enough, maybe, see what I mean? It didn't have anything to do with love. I was so preoccupied with the end times, with the book of Revelation, with death, that it's like, see what I mean? It, there was no witness. My, it wasn't on getting people saved into communication with, with, with God. That wasn't even the issue. It was just based solely off the fear that was taught to me. So then every time anything with the book of Revelation or the end times came up, instant dread would clinch my heart. If there was a song about the end times, that song, I wish we'd all been ready. Oh, no! I mean, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people in the church, even today, that are scared to death of the end times. But I just don't voice these fears because, you know, everybody else seems to be really looking forward to it, especially the elderly. As it's like, well, I, I better hop on board or I'm the sinner. So um, that kind of leads directly into this. Why do you think people are scared of the end or death or the book of Revelation? Can I be afraid of the unknown? Okay. They're Very good all... answer. No, no, hold, hold just one second. Could you elaborate? Like some people... They read Revelation, so they kind of get an idea, uh -huh. but they don't know, you know, hey, am I saved? Am I going to be here for this? Mm. Am I going to have to deal with this? Mm. Or will I not? Yeah. Good point. What were you going to say? Uh, they're in more academy. Is, what do you mean? Well, I mean that they question about their in more academy. Okay. So whether they're going to make it or... Or, or right. Okay. 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 That's a good answer, too. Uh, anybody else? I know for me, the one thing that used to scare me when I was young was the thought of eternity. Oh, yeah, buddy. Because I would always yeah, wonder, what's after that? Yeah. And just trying to wrap my mind around that yeah. freaked me out. Yeah, buddy. Same train here, buddy. <laughs> oh, man, yeah. 
Wow. That, I think that one I relate to the most. Yeah. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> People not knowing if they're saved or not. Okay. So is that what you were saying? Somewhat similar. Yeah. Maybe a different wording. But okay. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm going to have to agree with Nicole. I think it's fear of the unknown because even though we know like we're going to heaven, it's still, we don't, we don't know what that's like. And I think something that's always scared me about death is how am I going to die? Is it going to hurt? Is it going to be like painful to my <laughs> breath? Like or... just holding my breath, I freak out. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Buddy. It's just, it's just, and then, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it is a scary yeah. thing. Whether yeah. you're saved or not, I think death yeah. is a little bit yeah. scary. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I, I didn't think you guys would be giving the exact same things that I experience and have experienced. <laughs> wow. <laughs> now, I, now I feel like, you know, hey, we're all in the same boat on this one. <laughs> Anybody else have anything else? A judgment. Okay. Judging them, right. you know. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that, that you know. I think people have a huge misconception about yeah. what judgment entails. I think they think that they're going to be standing in, in a long line with the big screen TV. By God, yeah. Yeah. with the big screen you TV, did right? This, you did not do this, and you're going. And you didn't share that thing on Facebook. Right? Satan got to win every time. Yeah. Every time. <laughs> oh, <a> check message. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I keyed, I keyed. <laughs> oh my gosh, did anybody else have anything else? How about the people don't believe in all this? Well, I don't think you can really be afraid of something you don't, you don't right. believe in. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I think for me, when I, was, when I kind of first got saved, I heard some you know, conflicting stories about even as Christians, we would be here for the tribulation. Mm -hmm. And then I heard, no, we won't. And I was like, so are we going to be here or not? Like, what I do I know. do? <laughs> this like, is, is something that's good for me to know. Can you enlighten me? <laughs> What's going to happen? Like, am I going to be here or not? And that was really, like, troubling for oh. me. What about the, um, you know, you thinking about, you know, when you go to heaven stuff, People are scared and worried of the people that didn't make it. Mm. Mm, yeah. I think that's a good point. That is a good point. You know, especially um, parents concerned about their children yeah. and spouses yeah. mm -hmm. concerned yeah. for their spouses. Yeah. I think that those two things are, are, are pretty high up there. Um, yeah. Uh, any, anything else? The finger it descendeth. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about some common reasons. If you want to read along, you're going to need your Bibles. But if you don't want to read along, then you just don't need your Bibles. Number one, fear of the unknown. <laughs> Everything will change. Life as we know it will be different. And this can be very scary. I mean, honestly, how many of you have been nervous at your first day of work? First day of anything. First day, right. first day after high school when you realize, holy crap, I don't have the world figured out. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing with my life. <laughs> Genesis 3 8. <laughs> okay. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden of the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The first thing that I want to note about this fear specifically, the fear of the unknown, this is what people were made for. See, we've grown used to life like this, how it is on earth, but this was never how life was supposed to be. We've got accustomed to something that is subpar. Something that, think of it like this. Who here has eaten at a really fancy restaurant? Like everything is professional. Everything was was out in a timely manner. The cook, it, it was made very well. They have professional chefs. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Now let's, let's say that you've been eating McDonald's every single time you go out. Mm -hmm. And then you go to that restaurant mm -hmm. where they give you a steak that's perfectly cooked by a master chef. 
you never experience this. Uh-huh. It's the unknown, but it's so much better. Yeah. See what I mean? And that's kind of how it is here. We were made for that five-star restaurant. See what I mean? And only through sin did we get to this place, as degraded as it is, and we've gotten used to it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like a pig who, who gets used to the mud that it's going around and with all its crap in there and everything. It's just gross. You know what I mean? But we don't see how gross it is because, you know, we're used to it. You know what I mean? Um, Matthew 6, 27. I heard multiple answers that were on here. Multiple answers that were on here. Matthew 6, 27 says, And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? What Jesus oftentimes talked about was not being afraid of things that you can't change. In fact, a lot of Jesus' teachings revolved around doing in the present what you can. You know what I mean? The end is coming, but let it worry for itself. You know what I mean? Today, are you dying? No, you're not dying right now. I mean, unless you suddenly have a heart attack, but I mean, nobody can foresee that. You know what I mean? Um, and, and so it's better and really more relaxing, really, to just live in the now. And when you get there, worry about it then. You know what I mean? Worry about it then. It's the same thing. And obviously Jesus is, is, is talking about, you know, uh, having the food, uh, the clothes that you need and the food that you need and that kind of stuff. But I think that the principle still remains. You know, tomorrow has enough worries of its own. Yeah. Let it be in the future. Right now. Just, you know what I mean? Focus on the now. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, <clears throat> how, many, how many people, how many of you have heard that saying YOLO? You only live once. Now, people have taken that and kind of run with it to where, you know, hey, do whatever dumb thing comes to your mind. Right. But what YOLO actually meant originally was you only have one life. Make sure it counts for something important. That's where the term actually came from. It just got corrupted to mean let's go do something stupid while we're still alive. Okay, so. <laughs> Sounds better. Yeah. <laughs> right. So. Revelations 2 7 says. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Whenever God is talking about, you know, the new heavens, the new earth, he never talks about it in a scary tense. He always talks about it in a in a fulfillment text. You don't have to be afraid anymore. It says in one place that God wipes away the tears. You don't have anything to worry about anymore. It's a paradise is the word that it uses. You know, I mean, think about that. When you think of a paradise, what do you think of? An island in in the in the Caribbean yeah. with the with the waves hitting the beach. You know, you think of something really relaxing and nice, something that you're looking forward to. That's how God talks about the new heavens and the new earth. It's a paradise. It's something not to fear, but it's something that's relaxing, something that's good. Yeah. See what I mean? So, um, any questions on that one? No. Okay. Um, religious people. Sometimes religious people can can scare us. Um, this was really big for me. Um, you know, they they get up there and they seem to know what they're talking about, and they start talking about revelation and they just drone on about all these bad things that are going to happen. And they scare the crap out of you. You know what I mean? Those religious people have a way of just making you sweat in your seat. I mean, you're saved and you're going up for salvation again. You're like, God, I'm repenting again. Forgive me again. I mean, maybe I'm not uber saved. Get me, get me ultra saved. Maybe I'm only saved like 24%. I want to be saved like 110%. Let's do that. You know what I mean? So you go up to every altar call because you need to get saved every single service because who knows? Maybe you didn't mean it. Maybe you did something between now and then that just erased your salvation. Whatever it is, you need to get back in there and make sure this sucker is resolved. <laughs> so, um, but the thing about scare tactics is they withhold love. Yeah. Uh, let me put it like this. Let's say you have a child and... You want them to do what you're telling them to do. So what do you do? You threaten them. If you do that, I will take away your PlayStation and burn it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you scare the crap out of them. You know what I mean? Or you could parent by love. Which, what does the Bible say about parenting out of love? If you withhold your rod, you hate your child. If you withhold that discipline, you hate your child. See what I mean? But it doesn't have to be a thing of fear. 
See what I mean? How, how many of us, at least once, our parents put the fear of God in us? If you do that, I'm going to tell your dad when he gets home. Oh, buddy. Buddy, I had that happen to me. I was like, oh, my gosh. I'm, I'm done. I, I'm, I'm going to go sit over there and be good. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, buddy. But uh, for that, um, let's look at Matthew 10. Now, I kind of overlooked this passage a lot of times, but I think this is extremely important. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, at first glance, it seems like, oh, but that's still teaching us to be fearful. But the moral of the story is this. this uh, what he's actually talking about is this. Rather than being afraid and concerned about all these people saying all these things, rest your life, rest your eternal life in God's hands. See what I mean? You only have something to fear. Hebrews talks about this. You only have something to fear if you don't repent. So as long as you're saved, see what I mean? As long as you're saved, not as long as you're perfect, not as long as you don't ever sin in your life, not as, not as long as, you know, um, you, you, you don't ever mess up or whatever. No, no, no. As long as you are saved, as long as Jesus is intercessing for you, interceding for you, see what I mean? Then you don't have anything to fear because God is the one who's interceding for you. You don't have to fear. That's what he's saying. Rather than being afraid of the temporary things. Like that, those pastors, there'll always be those pastors. There will be. People, it's always appealing, especially as an authority figure, to scare people into doing what you want them to, rather than serving. Why? Because it gets way quicker results. When you have, when you run a business, if you scare your employees, oh, I, I can't lose my job, I need this money. They'll work harder. Not for as long, and they won't do as good of a job. But they'll work harder for that day or two that you need to meet that deadline. Whereas if you're a servant leader, you can motivate your, your, your employees to do a better job for longer. See what I mean? And it's the same thing with, with everything. Um, our kids, our, our companies, our, our churches, everything really runs on the same thing. We don't have to use scare tactics, but we do because it gives us instant results. See what I mean? I mean, let's be honest here. I know I've told I've told kids before if you don't do that to, to you know try to scare them into doing the right thing. I mean let's be honest. Don't look at me with those looks like you don't do these things. Back off all of you. Because <laughs> I mean come on. Um, but anyways, Psalm forty six one. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. A very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. Didn't this just sound like a lot of what a lot of people say about the end times and how we have everything to fear? Isn't this exactly what that sounds like? I'll read that again. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way. Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. See what I mean? Why? Why? Because God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. See what I mean? Regardless of the future, we can know that we can trust in God now. Whatever happens tomorrow, it'll happen tomorrow. But in the now, we can always trust God. We don't have to be afraid because we can trust God. See what I mean? And your mind is, is going to wage war with you. You're going to have all kinds of different excuses why you should worry about this, that, or the other thing. Or you can trust in God. That's what it comes down to. And everybody's situations are different. We all have different things to worry about. But at the end of the day, we all have the same choice. Worry or stand in faith. The righteous will live by faith, right? Right? Okay. Not any questions on that one? Okay. Uh, number three. Flesh flight fights for pleasure. 1 Corinthians 15.31 I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. What Paul's talking about here is, is dying to self. Putting to, get, putting to death the, uh, the lust of the flesh. You know what I mean? Why don't we go out and get drunk? Why don't we go in and cuss people out? Why don't we go and steal? Why don't we go out and have sex with whoever the heck we want? 
Why do we not do these things? Because we die daily. We put to death the lust of the flesh, right? That's what he's talking about, right? So how does this apply to this? Until you die, there will be an element of your body that doesn't want to die. Why? Because it's sinful and it, it, it enjoys the thing that's, that it is doing. See what I mean? Most people, in at least in moments of their life, derive some pleasure from life in something. I mean... Somewhere doing something, maybe they don't find life in general enjoyable, but still, there's usually at least something in their life that they enjoy, at least a little bit, watching TV or something. And our body likes that regular thing. Our bodies don't like to change things. They like to be comfortable. They like routines. If you don't believe me, ask a pastor <laughs> who's being asked to do another ministry. Mmm. <laughs> you know, they, 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 this is what they're thinking inside. They may give you the poker face, but inside they're going, No! That's my only open free night! You know what I mean? Yeah. Be because we like our routines, we like our thing. And that's going to be something that we're going to have to struggle with fear until the day we die about that. Because when we die, things are going to change. And our bodies don't like that. Not only that, but our bodies fight to live. We talked about panic two weeks, three weeks ago, right? And when we talked about that fight or flight, remember? You, the, the need to run. Why? Because your body is, is, is in hyperdrive. It wants to survive. See you know what I mean? It's that same thing. Your body wants to always find a way to live. How many of you guys, when you watch zombie movies, you're all, or whatever movies you like that are thriller, always think... Well, how could I survive past that? What could I do to have lived through that situation? You know what I mean? Maybe it's a post-apocalyptic post movie, and you're thinking, how would I have survived past a nuclear blast? You know what I mean? Because there's something in us that always wants to find a way to survive, to live past it, to, 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 to die another day, to be able to tell the tale to our children. You know what I mean? But there's always that element, and until the day we die, that's going to be an element of our lives. And that is because our bodies have not yet been perfected, which means fear will remain. We will be afraid of different things throughout the course of our life until we die. 1 Corinthians 15, 42, excuse me, uh, 42 through 49. Now check this out. So is it with the resurrection of the dead? What is sown is, is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. And I'm... No, I'll go ahead and read that. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man um, of dust, the second man is from heaven. Now, down in verse 48... As with the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust, and so and as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have uh, borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of um, heaven. See what he's saying there? This is something that we're going to be carrying until the day we die. But then when we do die, we're going to be given something imperishable. Something that doesn't fear anymore. How good does that sound? See what I mean? Do you ever get tired of waking up with with? Uh, did you have a question? No. Uh, did you ever wake up of? Uh, did you ever get tired of waking up um, and having aches and pains? Uh -huh. Do you ever get tired of your close fam family and friends dying? Do you ever get tired tired of of, of of seeing people who you want so much better for their life throwing it away? Don't you ever get tired of that? The perishable will be taken off and the imperishable will be given. See what I mean? You'll be given a new body. See what I mean? Things won't be like they are now. See what I mean? And we try to think of the new heavens and the new earth as though we're going to be the same outside when we get there. See what I mean? And that's what causes a lot of the fear. Not all the fear, and we'll get to that later. But we start thinking in terms of the same way we think now and applying it to how heaven's going to be then. See what I mean? And that gets us into all kinds of problems because our, we aren't thinking the same way we're going to think. See what I mean? So, any questions on that? Maybe I said that in a confusing way, you know? Okay. All right. 
Fear is natural in the flesh. Trust past the feelings. Jeremiah 17.9. These, all three of those related to each other. Jeremiah 17.9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Then he goes on to say about how God is able to search through the hearts of people and whatnot. Um, but the but the moral here being um, we have to trust the, trust in God that there's better things past what we feel in regards to death and the end and revelation and all that stuff. We got to believe that there's there, there's better. Um, and and realize that your body will always fight you on this, and you will all it will always um, conjure up something to fear. It will. That's going to be something that we all have to bear until death. Um, so that takes us to the next one here. Life stages. You know, when you're young and full of enthusiasm, death seems like the worst thing in the world. When you're 70, you're weak, and, you're, and, 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 and your wife is dead, suddenly death doesn't seem so such a bad thing. You know what I mean? I've talked to many old people that, that they're just, they just talk to you and they're like, you know, they're not depressed or anything. They just say, I'm ready. I, I'm ready. My time has come to an end and, and I'm ready. Why? Because of life stages. As we as we as we serve in Christ, God does a work in our hearts. See what I mean? Whereas other people who haven't ever submitted to God, I've seen 60, 70, 80 year old people who have never submitted to God, and they're scared to death at the end. Because God hasn't had those sixty years to prepare their heart. See what I mean? They've spent their whole life running from God and now they realize they can't run anymore and they're scared. See what I mean? That's something that you can't prepare for. But naturally God has a way of with those who submit to him when the time is right. He just has a way of preparing their hearts. Do you guys remember the Columbine uh, shooting with that Christian girl? Remember that? Yeah. Um, in her di through her diaries and whatever, uh, and, her, and discussions with her parents, whatever, they were talking about the way that, that she just knew that her time was coming. She knew it, and she was okay with it. See what I mean? God prepared her heart for what was coming before it came. And so when she got there, she was able to stand firm, and she was able to pass peacefully. See what I mean? There was a, another girl who got out of there and witnessed this, and, and and was talking about the way that the way that she had died. You know what I mean? God has a way of doing that. But naturally, in your life, there'll be different life stages. When you're out of college, you think that you can change the whole world. When you hit 30, you're like, oh my God, I haven't done anything with my life. When you hit about 45, I guess it is. It de it's different for everybody, but between 40 and 50, you start realizing my life is, is almost over. Then you hit about 60, and you're like, oh, I had a lot more life after 50 than I thought there was going to be. And then you hit about 70, and you're like, okay, I'm ready. See what I mean? There's just this natural pro progress of your life that people change. You know what I mean? You're going to change. How you feel about things is going to change. And where you are mentally and physically changes, and so how you feel about things is going to change. You know what I mean? When I was 18, I didn't care about voting because I was convinced I could change the world single-handedly. Now I'm 24 and my enthusiasm has gone down a little bit and I realize I need to vote because nobody else is going to. People don't care. <laughs> you know what I mean? You just start to change your perspective on different things. That takes us to Ecclesiastes, a book that I personally believe saw, uh, um, King Solomon was a little bit depressed when he wrote. But I can't really back that up with fact. It's just my own personal opinion. Um, starting in chapter 3, verse 2. Well, I'll start in verse 1. For everything there is a reason, I'm sorry, a season, and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. Then I'll hop down in 11. Um, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. See what I mean? Uh, you can you can you can study this passage for for months and still find new little things that he's saying. And then when in ten year in ten years when you're ten years older, you'll read it again and you'll understand something else he's talking about. You know what I mean? Because Ecclesiastes seems like a book that was written from a learned person. He spent some time in the trenches, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, anyways, any questions on that one? Okay, we're nearing the end of these. Wrong ideas of death and the end. I don't have any passage for this, but we're going to look at some of these in, in, in here on in a couple slides. Um, 
But for a lot of people, they just have the wrong a wrong idea at the end. You know what I mean? And it becomes very scary. Um, some people are scared of death because they think that life ends at death, that there's nothing afterwards. And so for some of them, it's very scary. But for some other people, that actually seems like a better alternative than eternity in heaven or hell. Um, there's this idea that, that heaven is this place with a bunch of clouds and everybody has wings. And there's harps everywhere. You know, there's really nothing really going on. It's just boring. Um, you no longer cease to be yourself, but you are now this just this exact replica of everybody else. You know, it's just all these different things that people assume is going to happen. And so this, obviously, people scare themselves by having the wrong idea of what happens at the end, of what's going on at death. You know what I mean? So, um, which I believe somebody mentioned. That was Serena, right? You mentioned this? Somebody mentioned about wrong ideas of the end, right? Or, I mean, of death, right? Somebody? No? I don't know. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, assuming everyone deserves mercy. Um, this is one that really greatly appeals to the American mindset is we just assume that everybody is basically good and everybody deserves to be saved. I mean, how could a loving God not save someone when the truth is that people are very wicked and people continually reject God and rebel against God? And God didn't have to send Jesus in the first place. He did because he loves people so much. That's why. See what I mean? He, he did what he did, and it, Peter, St. Peter even says this in chapter 3, verse 7, I think, um, that God doesn't desire for anyone to be saved, and that's why he's being so slow about the promise. He's being patient. He's being patient to bring, it, to bring about his fulfillment because he wants people to be saved. Obviously, the whole Old Testament shows us that. How many prophets did he send that are recorded? Not the ones that were sent. I mean, I'm sure there were many more that didn't even get their own books. But just the ones who made it into our Bible. You know what I mean? There's the major prophets, which are four. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. And then you have, I believe there's 12 minor prophets, somewhere around there. Um, I, I think that that's a lot of prophets. I could be wrong. I think that's a lot of prophets. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, uh, Romans 3, 23 uh, says it like this. Okay. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Nobody deserves salvation. As much as the American population would like you to think this, nobody deserves salvation. It is by God's grace that we have been saved. We didn't do anything to deserve it. And guess what? The longer you're saved... This is what I thought. I thought that you were saved by grace, but then... As you are saved, you know, you have to do everything perfect or God's going to just take away your salvation. That's just going to be it. Well, no. The same as you are saved by grace, you you, you are kept in salvation by grace. See what I mean? So, and we'll talk about this in two weeks. But salvation isn't just this willy-nilly thing that can just be dropped off and picked up at will. You know what I mean? It's something that, that's a little bit more eternal than that. <laughs> so we'll talk about that later, though. Um so a lot of people have a hard time thinking about the end times because they're thinking about all this destruction that's coming, and, and surely God wouldn't do that to people. See what I mean? People don't deserve that grace. They don't. Which should make us a little bit more grateful for our salvation, right. that we can count ourselves among the children of God. I mean, that's a pretty powerful statement. Um, losing loved ones. Uh, uh, Gracie brought this up, and Lauren brought this up actually um, a couple weeks uh, before you weren't there, but it was at a, it was at a worship practice. She brought this up, and it's kind of a, a, a recurring thing uh, with parents that they are very much afraid of losing their kids. And so I'm going to try to approach this as del delicately as possible. First off, Matthew 10:37. I've been nervous to talk about this point two weeks now because I didn't want anybody to think something that I'm being like, I don't know, mean or, you know what I mean? I'm trying to give a balanced biblical perspective while still being sensitive to people's, you know, feelings. And so, I, I mean, I really hope that I do that. Matthew 10.37 says this, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. I'm not trying to guilt trip people who are concerned about their kids. That's not what I'm talking about at all. What I'm saying is God loves our kids and our spouses and our loved ones more than we could ever love them. Okay? God desires for them to be saved more than we could ever desire that. See what I mean? But 
we have to pick God over those people. God, even if they never, even if they never repent, I'll still trust that you are good, and I'm still going to serve you, even if they never change. But God, you, you could make them change. You could you could twist their arms into it. God doesn't do that. He didn't do that to Adam and Eve, and he sure as heck isn't going to do that to, to our loved ones. Why? Because God gives us the choice. And Deuteron how does Deuteronomy, uh, the last part of Deuteronomy end? Today I set before you life or death. Choose life that you may live. He's pleading with the people to please choose life, please. But at the end of the day, it's your choice to walk through it. God's not going to force you into salvation. He's not going to... And this is something that people get confused about because of a, a doctrine called Calvinism, which is basically that pre... Well, there's different degrees of Calvinism, so I'm not trying to oversimplify this, but one of the better, well, better known teachings of Calvinism is that there's something called irresistible grace, that if God desires for you to be saved and you are one of the elect, you are going to be saved no matter what you want, no matter what you do, you're going to be saved. Which ultimately means that those who are not elected, God has predestined for damnation. In other words, God has made some people for the sole purpose of destroying them. Right? Because if he's made some people for the sole purpose of election, see what I mean? Obviously, I don't believe this in that. I think it's a, hard, it's a load of crap. However, we're not talking about predestination tent. We'll talk about that probably with the salvation lesson. Probably. Um, so we'll probably talk about that in two weeks. So... Um, but anyways, we have to love God more than we love our spouses, more than we love our kids, more than we love our parents, more than we love our best friends. See what I mean? And we should never have div divided loyalties, which is a hard thing to say because even as I say that, I know that sometimes, at least sometimes, I'm guilty of having split loyalty. I mean, don't look at me like that. Sometimes you think, if that person doesn't make it to heaven, do I even want to be there? Be honest with me here. Be honest with me. Don't look at me like that. So it's hard to maintain loyalty to God above all else. It's hard. Twelve forty-eight, um, which is just two chapters later. Um, where are you? Right here. But he replied to the man who told him, "Who is my mother and who are my brothers?" And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, "Here are my mother and my brothers." For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Nowadays, more than ever, we have a perfect example of this. We have fathers who get women pregnant and then just hop town. Mothers who get pregnant and don't want the baby, so they abort. I mean, this is just all over our all over our culture. Self-serving parents. See what I mean? Self-serving family members. See what I mean? And yeah, there are good ones. People who adopt people. People who who genuinely care and genuinely do something, even for one. There are those people out there. But it seems like our culture as a whole has this mindset of just everybody for themselves. Whereas last generation thought that family was anybody who was related by blood, this generation thinks that family is anyone who proves it by action. Complete difference. Complete difference. And they actually don't see eye to eye on this a lot, which causes a lot of problems with you know bitterness and that kind of stuff, which Pastor talks about all the time, so I'm going to talk about some other time. Um, but the image that God shows us in his word is our true brothers and sisters, our true mom and dads, are the people that are part of his kingdom. Those are our true family. Does that make sense? Does that kind of make sense? You know what I mean? All, I mean, maybe even some of us here have been orphaned by our family members because of our Christianity. So, I mean, kind of like pushed away because of that. I've known many people who, who that was the case, I, more so in other nations like India and whatnot, but, I mean, still does happen in America. Kind of that idea of, you know, if you're going to abandon the family religion, you see it happen with, with with traditional Catholicism. Not the actual, you know, believing in Jesus, but I'm talking about going through the motions. Oh, well, I went to, I went to Mass last week. So, I mean, that kind of Catholicism. Um, <clears throat> and it just, yeah. So, anyways, Romans 1.17 any questions on this? I might not be clear on this, and I think that's why I'm taking so long on this point, is I don't want it to be um, unclear or mean. Okay. Romans 1.17. Um, For in it the righteousness... Is that the right... Yeah. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith, for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. We have to trust in God regardless of what we see. Sometimes we're going to pray for a family member till the day we die, and we may not even see them saved. 
See what I mean? And you just have to trust God with it. Because we live by faith. We, we trust that God knows what's best, and as we pray and seek his face, he works it into being. But ultimately, you know, God's God and we're not. And that's very hard to do because at least some of us have that idea of, you know, if you don't say my, my kid's God, I... See what I mean? We have that split loyalty that I was talking about. And, I mean, maybe if you haven't personally said this in your hearts, maybe it's something that you've still witnessed in other people. Uh, so St. Peter 3.7 was the passage that I quoted earlier, and I'm going to read it. Um, but, by, um, but by the same word, the heavens... Of, oh, I'm sorry, that's St. Peter. 3.9. 9, I'm sorry, 3.9, not 3.7. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish but that all should reach repentance. God desires for your family members to be saved more than you do, but he's not going to force his hand on people. He's going to let them choose. Okay, He, he, he could have not given us a will in the first place. He gave us a will so that when we chose him, it would actually be us choosing him, and we could actually make our decisions in life. He did that on purpose. I think that he meant for us to choose ourselves. Um, another is fear of destruction. They're they're afraid of the afraid of the end times. They're afraid of you know all the destruction that's going on on Earth. They're afraid that they're going to have to be a part of that destruction or you know whatever. And it's just kind of a little vague on that. So let's go to Acts two thirty seven. And the the spirit has just fallen on the disciples in the upper upper room. And Peter gets up to preach because there's some people who think that they're that they're just drunk. So Peter gets up to to preach and and he says this uh, throughout the course of the discussion. Excuse me. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise of, is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. See what he says? So... For those who are afraid of destruction, um, you don't have to be afraid. God saves those. He is a tower. We talked about this, the tower of refuge, right? An ever-present help. Those who call on the Lord, those who those who seek him for salvation, they will be saved. So, I mean, you only have something to fear if you're not submitted to the Lord. That's the only way you have something to fear. Otherwise, you have nothing to fear. Um, because that, what do what they say? What are we going to do? Like, we're going to be destroyed. Repent. That was his answer. Repent. It was that simple. So, um, First John. Now, this is something that's taken very far out of context. So, I wanted to mention it um, to kind of give it context, since we're talking about the fear of um, death and the end times and all that stuff. First John four seventeen through eighteen says this, um, and I guarantee you, at least some of you have heard this passage before. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. Whoever fears has not been perfected uh, in love. Okay. How many have heard this passage, at least in, in part? Especially for those of you who have gone through things like maybe anxiety. I heard it with anxiety. Did anybody hear anybody hear that uh, as applied to you that you know whatever you were going through all of a sudden this applied no, buddy you're missing out <laughs> you don't know how many how many uh, super spiritual you know old women <laughs> thought that they were giving me a word with this one and it's like I'm not sure how to receive that like is that a good thing that you're telling me or is that a bad thing because that means like I'm not saved right mm -hmm. let's actually look at it in context um so he starts out here. By this is love perfect um, is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Confidence for what? The day of judgment. Okay. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. He's talking about he's talking about the end here. Basically, what he's saying is saying is this: when the time comes, you'll be perfected in love. Right now, I'm having a hard time oversimplifying this. I'm wanting to kind of overcomplicate it.
basically he's saying, okay, here's a good way to say it. In the end, you don't have anything to fear with the end because you're saved and you're going to be perfected. Okay, that's basically what he's saying. Okay. This is what how people take it to mean, though, now. If I ever have a, have a fear in my life, I am not saved. He's not even talking about salvation. He's talking about the end. You, you can have confidence that when that time comes, God will save you. That's what he's talking about. See what I mean? A lot more applicational now that we actually know the context, isn't it? Now, once again, I'm oversimplifying it because I don't have time to do a study on 1 John, but I hope that you understand the overall principle that I'm talking about here. Right? Did anybody questions? No? Okay. All right. All right, because that, that's a passage that's been... It, it's been used so terribly, and... Another common reason, reason is judgment... Um, these kind of all these last two kind of go um, go hand in hand. The the first one is more of fear of destructions and fear of destruction of the earth and that kind of stuff. Um, this one has more to do with personal judgment, you personally, and they kind of both overlap, kind of. So I mean it's hard to put too big of a distinction, but I figured it was worth mentioning as two different points just in case. Hebrews ten twenty six through twenty seven says this. God? Is that you? For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. See what he just said? If we go on and do our own thing, we already have the truth and we just choose not to live by it. We choose not to submit to God. We go out and do whatever we want whenever we want. Well, that's fine. Whatever. So, I mean, then we have something to fear. Then all we have to look forward to is, is, is judgment. And then down in uh, verse 37-39. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. Now, why I read this is because I want to kind of say something. The end is going to happen. We don't know when. We don't know, you know how, how it's, everything's going to go down. We don't know all the specifics. But we do know that the end is eventually going to happen. Okay? But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. This is now the second time in a, two different parts of, of the scripture that we've read, the righteous one shall live by faith, isn't it? Right? But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and, pre and preserve their souls. What he's talking about is keep on going. We all have struggles. Hebrews shows us that. But what he's talking about is abandoning the faith. That's what he's talking about. And we, we talked about this two years ago when we talked about Hebrews. So, um, any questions on any of those things? No? I mean, you guys listed half the things before I got to them, so. No questions? Anything do you need me to go back over? Anything that I was unclear on? Anything that you feel like I left out? Okay, we're good? All right, onward and upward. What do you know about Revelation? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Anyone? The red and yellow is China's flag, and they're going to be the enemy that's <laughs> Does anyone know anything actual about Revelation? <laughs> well, let's see. Tim LaHaye once said... Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. A, a note a note on the text. <laughs> Nothing that you read in a left behind novel can be used. <laughs> Nothing that you heard from John Hagen can be I used. I only read through the first left behind. Oh I my gosh, I tried. I, I wanted to get into that fad. I did, yeah, but I, I couldn't. To, but I, I couldn't. I couldn't even make it to, through chapter one. I was just like, and I'm sorry, but Christian books already Christian fiction books already. There's so few good ones. And so then I'm not going to waste my time on ones that just, you know, so drastically abuse the book of Revelation. And that, and just, no, I, I, I have other things to do with my time. I Anyways. I saw that behind movie from the 70s. Yeah? <laughs> like, the, like the first one, oh like the first God. ever one made. <laughs> wow. And I showed a mom boiling a pot of whatever, and then all of a sudden she's gone. Yeah. And the kid's like, Mommy? And then the song plays, I Wait, wish we'd all be <laughs> They let the kids burn. Oh my gosh. 
Whoa, and that guy dark, Trina. No wonder we've never seen that one. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> have, you seen, have you seen the Nicolas Cage one? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I haven't. I was just saw it. I was like, Nicolas Cage? No, thank it's you. Terrible. <laughs> you saw it. <laughs> The one with, uh, what is his name? Kirk Cameron. The one with Kirk Cameron was terrible already. No, but this is like a million (laughs) times more terrible. Wow. Because this is like the first 15 minutes of the of the Kirk Cameron one stretched out into two hours. Wow. Like they didn't, he didn't even leave the airport. Oh my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Make it stop, God. But back on topic, what do you know about Revelation? This is kind of my point. Nobody really knows anything about Revelation. Well, the guy that used to do the Revelation things at Mountain View, I think he died, so. I stopped learning about it when he died. Oh, I, I gotcha. I, I gotcha. <laughs> there, there's lots of analogies. Elaborate. What do you mean? Like the seven uh, churches. Seven churches. Seven churches. Okay. Yeah. There is a lot of ambiguity in the book. Yeah. There is a lot of ambiguity. I know that John was on the island of Patmos. Very good. And he was given the vision. Very good. Jesus. And, and, uh, oh, what did he call it? I know that uh, there's only two angels n- named in the Bible, and one of them is in Revelation. Have you been talking to Susan? No. Oh, well, I'm very <laughs> proud of you. Because... Abaddon is the only other uh, angel, which is like the angel of Hades. What? Yeah, Say what? and he's the only other angel talked about. Michael and Gabriel? Oh, Michael and Gabriel. No, there's four. He's the fourth one. I was going to say. Mm. Sorry, I, meant, I did not mean to. Four. There's four. He's the fourth. Gotcha. I gotcha. Anyways, that's the <laughs> Oh, and he was supposed to swallow up the last the scroll, and it was tasted like... Honey, but it was bitter. I thought that was Ezekiel. No, that's in Revelation. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Wow, I got my prophets confused. Was John had to eat the scroll. And I'm the one teaching the class. I ought to be ashamed. Get out of here. Okay, he's gone. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take over from you on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's all in. Okay, well, I mean, that that's good. You knew that he ate a scroll that was very yucky. I it thought that was Ezekiel. good, but it went sour. <laughs> Haven't you? Oh, and you know what I hate about the flu is when that happens. <laughs> like you eat pizza and you're like, it's so awesome, and then like you wake up at three and you're like, oh. I love eating scrolls. <laughs> I can't eat scroll anymore because I got sick of it. He he all goes back to his family and they're like, would you like some fried scroll? Oh no, I had my fill of that and fatness. <laughs> <laughs> He's but like, okay. The word of God is like bread, but it was really. Good. It's no boy, boy, you know? You're not supposed to literally eat it. <laughs> I'm going to read the Bible so I gain his power. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, sorry. That, sorry. Half of that was my fault, but she did the other half. <laughs> so, does anybody else know anything about Revelation? <laughs> oh, it's supposed to bring hope, not fear. Is that on your page? No, it's not. <laughs> yeah, it is. Oh. <laughs> I, I think Gracie cheated. She was I was thinking, I knew it was in one of the versions of my sheet, but did I leave it on there? <laughs> okay. Well, does anybody else who doesn't cheat have anything to say about Revelation? <laughs> I know it talks about the seven scrolls, mm-hmm. but I don't really remember details. Okay. 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 Yeah. You lied. You said you didn't know anything else, and you just busted out with bowls. Like, whoa! She knows about bowls, people. Don't take her to Walmart with you. She'll always have a different store to go to. True. <laughs> the woman and the dragon. Yes. Okay. Do you guys want to know a little bit about Revelation then? Okay. First thing but that, that's not on here. <laughs> Revelation's purpose is, is on your sheet, not on here. Revelation's purpose is to give hope to the church. Okay. And this is the stru- kind of the structure of, of Revelations. Things just keep getting worse and worse in the world. Right? Mm-hmm. That's just kind of the structure of Revelation. Things just keep getting worse. Okay. 
Okay. Now, some people, Revelation has been understood in different lights throughout the years, and so there's been a lot of confusion about this, especially with people saying that America was uh, the new the new Israel with the promise and all that nonsense. Then Revelations was then put over into America getting a bad president. Then obviously meant that it was the Antichrist, which led which leads into the tribulation, all these different things. Not really what he's talking about. He's talking more, more about on the global perspective. Things um, are, are going kind of like this. Okay, and, and just to kind of clarify, did you know that things got better after the Reformation? People had religious freedom in America. But then some very bad things happened from that. Jehovah's Witness, Mormonism, cough, cough. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but then, you know, overall, things are things are progressively getting 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 worse, yes, but what Revelation shows is as the end approaches. See, things are going to go like this a lot, but then at some unforeseen time in the future, let's just say time X, things are going to start going like this. There's going to be a lot of persecution, a lot of suffering and whatnot. Then somewhere over here somewhere, there's going to be the rapture of the church. But the church is going to have to go through some times of tribulation before the, the, time, the, seven, the seven years, whether they're literal or not, doesn't matter. Okay, before that time. So things are going to get worse. People are going to, there's going to be a lot of suffering, a lot of that kind of stuff going on. Then there's going to be rapture at some undisclosed time. And then there's going to be, um, I bet you that's going to come back on in five minutes. Because I, I think my finger accidentally touched a thing. Um, so then after that, there's going to be the, the, the rapture. And then there's going to be the, the final climax of all this, all these things, right? Okay. So that's just kind of the overall thing. Now, something that's important to note, Revelation does not meant the, uh, mention the rapture. Never once mentions the rapture. The rapture is mentioned by Paul in, I believe, Second Thessalonians, maybe first, something like that. He mentions about you know the, hearing the horn and that kind of stuff, and the people taking up the dead and Christ shall rise first and all that stuff. Not even in, in Revelation. Revelation is not mentioned the rapture. So just something to, to note. I don't know if that's important. I think it's more because Re Revelation is trying to show the overall things getting worse rather than the timing of everything. And by the way, Revelation is not chronological all the time, okay? And things aren't always literal, okay? Um, so, uh, so it starts off with prophetic words to, to seven churches. Um, and he gives a list of things that they're doing good and things that they're doing bad. I believe that there are two churches who weren't who were, weren't reprimanded for anything, and I believe that there were two churches who d didn't have anything good said about them. I believe, not positive, okay. Um, but either way, there's you know he goes to these seven churches and he, t he says these different things, and it kind of starts out the same way. Um, I know this about you. If if you persevere, this is going to happen. You know, he just kind of says the same thing. Um, he talks about the one who's going to spit out of his mouth and that kind of stuff. But it's kind of the same same setup the whole way through. Um, and that's, I think, chapters 2 and 3. Um, but one of the biggest things we see in Revelation is that there is a reason to persevere. Especially when we go through a lot of hard times and we don't see God answering the promises that he's given us maybe a long time ago. I mean, Revelation was written in, 90, in the 90s A.D., Jesus promised that he'd be back in the 30s AD. It's been 40 years. They were like, well, 40 years? Where did I get that? It's been 60 years. <laughs> that was stupid. Um, it's been 60 years, and they're just kind of looking around there thinking, okay, what's going on now? You know, And it's kind of hard to keep on going when you think, well, maybe I was wrong. Maybe Jesus was lying, or maybe, you know, maybe you know, I was hallucinating or whatever. And so then it gets to this. Hmm. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So obviously going on about the different good things that are for those who persevere. Then we get to chapter 4. Um, 4, 2 through 3. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24... Uh, were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. So he's talking about all these, you know, he talks about the the, the churches and everything, and then out of nowhere he just starts talking about the glory of God and the glory of the throne room. Out of nowhere. It has nothing to do with the end times. He just goes there. You know what I mean? And then he starts talking about all this, all this worship that's going on, all, all this stuff. And it's like, what? The reason why this is here is to show us there are more important things going on. 
Okay? God is still God throughout all these different things, throughout all of our trials, throughout all the different things that are, are coming, that are happening, throughout all these different things. There's more important things going on. God's still on the throne. He's still being worshipped. He's still got a hold on everything. See what I mean? How hard is it to how hard is it to believe that God still has everything under control when you don't see anything happening? Yeah? Well, this is 2,000 years later than John wrote the book. It is now. See you know what I mean? Sometimes it's hard to keep the faith. Now, it never said that the last days would be long or short. It just said that it would be the final hour and it would be the last days. It never said how long those last days would be. Technically speaking, it could go on for a million years or it could happen tomorrow. Technically speaking. We don't know. So, um, <clears throat> so then he goes on to why bad things are happening and will continue to happen with the dragon and the woman that uh, Chuck mentioned. So chapter 12 of Revelation, and I'm not going to talk about the whole thing. I'm just going to talk about this right here. When the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. Obviously then, just so that we're all on the same page here, the dragon is the devil, uh, the woman is Israel, and the child is Jesus. Okay? Um, but the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is nourished for a time and a time and a half time. There it is. Told you I hit the wrong button. Okay, um, and then in verse 17, and Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, Christians, um, on, those, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand in, um, of the sea. So now we have, we are going to face persecution because the devil is furious at his loss. See? So, okay, it's explaining stuff to us. Um, but then we see in 13, 5 through 6, God is in control, and he is the main character in the book of Revelation, even though all these different bad things are happening. Um, and the beast was given a mouth, um, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. Who is the main person who's being despised and attacked against? God. He's a t Because Satan is, against, is going against God... We are being are going. He's persecuting us. See what I mean? But the main character is still God. We are suffering because we are His ambassadors. So then he goes on in verse six. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies, blasphemies against God, blaspheming His name and His dwelling. That is those who dwell in heaven. But did you guys see, hear what it said? And it was allowed to exercise authority. See, all throughout these different things, it always talks about God allowing these things. Now, obviously, since God's the one who's being blasphemed against. He has the ultimate say so. See what I mean? So we have God in control, and all even though the you know the, the oh this is a bad scary thing that's happening, he only had the power. These different the beasts only had the only has the power that God allowed him to have. See what I mean? So that takes us to this: evil will never win. They only get what God allows. Chapter seventeen, verse fourteen. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called and chosen and faithful. See? Now imagine that you're going through these different things. Okay, God's going to win. And then what does it say? And those with whom are called. Did you know that you're called? We'll talk about this in two weeks, but you are called. You didn't get to the church in accident. You're, you are called. Chosen and faithful. See, called and chosen both has to do with God, but then it gets this part. Faithful. What is he trying to tell his people, to, the people of the church, to do? Keep going, keep persevering. So I mean, you have to put yourself in the mindset of, of back then and at the time. Okay. You know what the funny thing is though? Revelations was written about 96 A.D. Do you know when um, Emperor, um, I think it was Domitian. Don't hold me on that, but I think it was Emperor Domitian's um, persecution stopped right after the Book of Revelation was, was written. John wrote this book about all these bad things happening, and then the persecution stopped. Huh. How funny must have that looked like? Oh, this is just false or whatever. And then they got to around the 300s AD, and things got so bad, they actually thought that it was the tribulation. That's how bad things got. 300 years, or 200, technically 200 years later, but still. Um, so evil will never win. Did I already read the verse? Yeah. Okay, all right, awesome. Um, the rewards that are coming, um, and there is much more to come than there is, you know, in the bad now. 21, 3 through 4. Everybody here is familiar with Genesis, right? Here in Revelation, we have anti-Genesis. Okay? Check this out. 21, 3 through 4. 
And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, just like it was in Genesis, right? He will dwell with them, except actually it seems like this is more so than in Genesis, because Genesis we have God coming and co going in his manifestation. But in Revelation, it doesn't have any reference of God coming and going in his manifestation. It seems like he's always there. See what I mean? So that's something. They will uh, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. See, there's not even the possibility of death in heaven. In Genesis, there was the possibility of death, right? He said, don't eat of that, or else there will be death. Here, there's no possibility of death. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Did you, did you hear that last part? The former things have passed away. This is what we think, the end times. But the end times are actually more like the beginning times. History is working towards something that's really good. That's actually what we're made for. This is like, like reading a novel. This is the prologue of the novel. We haven't even hit chapter one yet. When does chapter one start? In the new heavens and the new earth. Well, when is that? In the future. See what I mean? We're so caught up on the prologue thinking that this is all there is, when there's a whole novel, there's a whole graphic novel that every chapter is better than the chapter before that's coming that way. See what I mean? So, once again, the, the way Revelations displays the end times is a lot different than you've probably heard pastors talk about the end times. Um, um, yeah. Much more to come. Elsewhere, it talks about, you know, um, the, the tree of life being, being there. Well, that's been taken away ever since Genesis, hasn't it? But we're going to see it again, aren't we? Um, and then it talked about here um, the way that he's going to take away all take away all these bad things. So awesome. Um, any questions on the Book of Revelation? Then that was just a real quick drive by. Well, oh, go ahead. Uh, um, this is probably a dumb question, but how did John get the letters to the churches? From that one? You know that I don't know if that's really recorded, but if he stuck with the regular method. He wrote it, and then when, when he was able to get off of Patmos, he probably um, went back to Ephesus where he lived and then had it, had a courier send it out. So he didn't die in Patmos? I, I, always I don't he believe did. he did, but he died shortly afterwards. But once again, Domitian, uh, the, the persecution of Domitian ended <coughs> just after Revelation was written. So he could have left Patmos after the persecution ended. Does yes. so that make sense? Mm -hmm. Kind of. Um, and... He he actually lived to be very old, which is how a rumor got going on that he wasn't going to die. In fact, if you've ever read the book Thirteenth Tribe, uh, the Thirteenth Tribe, um, it plays on that that John is ends up being you know the main good guy, and he's been alive for the past two thousand years. You know, it's not important. And major spoiler alert. Sorry about that. It, I hope you don't ever go to read the book because I just ruined the ending. But anyway. <laughs> Sorry, spoiler alert. Sorry about that, guys. Um, well, I figured Revelations is a giant spoiler alert. Come on! Come on! Just kidding. Um, what was I saying? Um, but anyways, um, and that's why at the end of the Gospel of John, there's a little part that's been added to your added to the Bible that says, um, this was to say what kind of uh, what kind of a death Peter would die, and it, it talks about uh, G, about John, and it says this doesn't. He didn't say that John wouldn't die, but that he could make him not die. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Exactly. That was added after John's death because they wanted to clarify the issue. They, Jesus never said that John wasn't going to die. We just assumed because he turned out to be really old. <laughs> <laughs> John had legs. <laughs> they stopped working. <laughs> they stopped working a thousand years ago. Um, so why is it important to know about the end times? This is something that's ne hardly ever asked. Why is it important to know about the end times? So we'll take it serious about our. Okay. Where are we going? Okay. Yeah. I think that's true. Yeah, I'll agree with that. When you don't know, you make stuff up. Yeah, I would agree with that too. I regret that too. I think that that has some something to do with it too. So we're aware. Okay, could you elaborate? Just so we kind of get an idea of what could happen. Okay. Okay. Good answers. Or Anybody to else? Encourage us as a witness. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Anything else? So that somebody said so that we're not afraid, but also so that we don't scare other people. Oh, right. Revelation. That's wrong. I reject that. <laughs> Revelation is so that we can scare people into church. <laughs> I think 
my own personal opinion, I think a large part of why God told us about the end times was to give us hope for a future, to take away that uncertainty of what's in, what's going to happen. But then I think that it was also for the sake of perseverance. I think God knows that if people don't know... How many have ever been a, a part of a project at work that you never saw the end, the end result for? You just work day in and day out, and you never see anything change. You're a mindless drone. And you know what? Your supervisors don't care about you. Ever had that job? God, it's not like that with God. God wants us to know that what we're doing is important. What we're doing is important. See what I mean? And he wanted to encourage them. It's not going to be forever, and I'm still in control. See what I mean? He wanted us to know that. So he gave us a, a books like Revelation. Then he also, but another thing is that we wouldn't get misled, which I'm going to play off what Ben said, you know, because people just make stuff up. Take, for instance, you know, the Jehovah's Witness and how they made this whole nonsense thing up about after words, you can still lose your salvation. After the resur resurrected body, you still have to be per perfect in sinless for a thousand years. And if you mess up once, you lose your salvation. Well, that doesn't sound like fun. Huh. I think that sounds really scary. Or what about um, the different people who, who you know, um, make it out to be that the world's just going to get better and better and that, that we're going to be able to, you know... Might as well make yourself comfortable. We're just going to keep on being reincarnated and everything's going to keep getting better and better. See what I mean? Well, now we know that that's a load of hogwash because God told us so. See what I mean? And I think there's other reasons too, but I think you guys all had really good, really, really good reasons. I, I want you to continue to think about that question though. Why is it important for me to know about the end times? And I think as you study and you just meditate on that while you pray, just think about that. And God will show you things in, in Revelation and First and Second Thessalonians in Matthew chapter 24, somewhere around there. He'll show you the different things about why he told these things. You know what I mean? Because I think there, I think every different part has a little bit something else. You know, like the the disciples are all look at how great of a structure we've built, Jesus. Look at this temple; it's so amazing. And he's all talking about, yeah, none of this is going to even be here. And you know, you know what I mean? Take kind of taking away that pride and kind of helping them to see the bigger picture. You know, but uh, I think another big reason why it was shown to us because God wants us to know. That this is the prelude to the book. <laughs> this isn't even the good stuff. Any blessings you get now, consider it a down payment for future glory. But it's nothing really substantial. This is just, you know, you're still going to... Spoiler alert, how this story ends here is you're going to die. It's the same story ending for everybody's story. They're all going to die. See what I mean? I, it's not that great of an ending. But there's something better because it's not the real ending. Ha! Huh? It's a fake ending. So... Um, what harm have you witnessed by the end times, death, or revelation being neglected or abused? Either overtaught or undertaught? Personally, I feel like I, I was pretty much undertaught mm -hmm. because I switched churches so often. I never really was in a church long enough to yeah. really fully understand. Mm. And I just, I feel like I don't, I don't know enough. Mm, I gotcha. But I know, I know the scary parts, but I don't, I don't know the full truth. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing with you because that's just like, yes, you know what, I know what you mean. I, I totally know what you mean. <laughs> oh, man, do I know what you mean. <laughs> wow. Anybody else? Harm or good, then? I mean, like you were saying earlier, as a kid, like, I never knew if I was saved because, you know, mm, that's they actually a good point. me what, you know, real salvation was. So every salvation prayer, I was always asking Jesus to forgive me. Mm. My heart. And, you know, I see that a lot. With Lack kids. of confidence. Yeah. I see that a lot with the kids in this church, too. And I'm yeah. like, guys, you already asked Jesus in your heart last time. You're, you're saved. You know yeah. that, right? And I explain it to them and everything. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that right there is one of my major concerns with it right there is people lose confidence yeah. when the end times is taught wrong or not taught you know what i mean in death and all these different things people start getting the idea in the world that their life just doesn't matter 
They kind of feel like maybe just another face in the crowd. You know what I mean? A lot of people feel like that. They get a job that they don't like, and they're always looking for another job, so they keep switching to different jobs, but no job satisfies them. They try to admit, try to fill it with their family, but at the end of the day, they still have a hard time going to sleep. Or maybe they have a hard time focusing at work. Or maybe, you know, go on through the list. It's it, We're all the same here. We all feel like faces in the crowd at different times in our lives. You know what I mean? Um and I think that th that a lot of a lot of this is, has to do with this, you know, not being taught or not being taught well. Anybody else? I I would elaborate on not being taught well. Um, there's a lot of things that are really misunderstood about the end times. I think, uh, especially like things like the mark of the beast and yeah. the. Uh, Isn't that cell phones? Exactly. <laughs> oh yeah, it's a tattoo. Anything like. They're putting chips in our children now to keep track of their medical records. It's like, you know, it doesn't say for sure. Like, we can't be afraid of every little piece of technology that's introduced that it might be the mark of the beast. Everybody calling Obama the Antichrist, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Who is it before it before him? Um, it was a big one. You guys remember this? Hitler, or, uh, Hitler was mentioned. The, yeah. The, oh, that, that, yeah. The Pope. That was the one that, that got me. Oh, yeah. And actually, that one's been a recurring theme throughout history. At the Reformation, recently with Fran Francis, uh, Pope Francis, and before him, Pope uh, Benedict, Benedict, I think. After him, after Francis. Was... No, I'm saying both. So some, I heard it about Pope Benedict, too. Oh. And I was thinking, he's still alive? <laughs> like, I never heard anything about Pope Benedict, like, ever. Occasionally some bad publicity, but that was it. Pope Francis, you hear about him all the time, and then people are like, he's the Antichrist. Forget about Obama, it's him. <laughs> okay. People become almost like conspiracy theorists over the whole yeah. thing. You know? Sure. Like, and it whoa. drives people crazy. You know, stop. Stop coming up with conspiracies and just read what? the Bible. And then we make YouTube videos. <sighs> I need to give a word of warning in case any of you guys ever feel called to do anything with YouTube in the future. Once you put something on the internet, it is impossible to get it off. It exists somewhere in the world out there, okay? Don't post dumb things on the internet. Rant over. Um, anybody else want to have you witnessed? Can I just elaborate yeah. on what you said about yeah, go ahead. the beast? Yeah. It could be something that we can't even see. Yeah. It could be on our hearts. Actually, that's a very good point. Because and the prophets multiple times talk about a mark on their hearts that, mm -hmm. that, that God will, will know his children by you know as his own. Very, very plausible, especially since how the mark of the beast is how, I mentioned how many times in the Bible? Once. <laughs> in one book, mentioned one place. Let's it's calm like down. <laughs> right. That it was like the center of right? revelation, because that's like the thing that everybody focuses on. And, and the number 666, how many times is that mentioned in the Bible? Once. What? It's just, right, no, I already said that about, about you. <laughs> You know, because it's close to your forehead and you hold it in your hand, so. Before I got saved, I know that that was only one of the very few things I even knew about the Bible. The Mark of the Beast or the 666? Mark Both of the Beast? Of it. Yeah. <laughs> Both of I wasn't even saying, but I knew about those two things. Yeah. Why? Because yeah. that's what people talk so much yeah. about. Yeah. Or is it, it's in a song as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then people take it to just dark places, too. Yeah. Yeah. Were you going to say something? I've also heard the number three could be like a demonic sign as well. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> it could be any number, yeah. right? Yeah, and then and then people run run wild with the whole seven day thing, and then twelve days, and I don't even know. Whatever. <laughs> whatever. Um, but yeah, I think I think you guys understand the basic the basic stuff here, and I think that I've learned some stuff too, and I would I would agree, you know, and I think moral of the story here, harm can come from bad teachings anywhere. And it's, it's really important that we seek out the truth, not just what people say. So let's really quickly go through some frequently asked questions. This is the last slide. After death, can you lose out on salvation? This is something that, that a lot of people ask, especially since Jehovah's Witness are right there and they teach that this is a thing. No. Hebrews 9.27 says that it's appointed for man once to die and then the judgment. Not once to die and then another time of testing and then the judgment. Okay? Once, then the judgment. Okay? Um, what happens when you die? What happens? You are with God. At the point of death, you're in God's presence. There is no overlap time, nothing like that. You will be here one moment and there the next. 
Okay. Um, 2 Corinthians 5 8, this is worth returning to. Um, I'll just very quickly, I don't want to waste too much of your time. I know I'm going extremely late today, which is funny because I just told somebody that I usually end by 8. And uh, yeah, I don't think I'm making that tonight. <laughs> yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Um, okay. And then, will we float around with harps and be bored? No. The, the Bible talks about our roles and the things that we'll be doing there. Talking about some of us being priests and, and stuff like that. Um, we will also still be uniquely us. We will be perfected in body, but we will still be us. Does that make sense? We will not be sinful, but you will still be individually you, uniquely you. You will still be completely present, completely conscious for this. Okay? You are not an angel. You are not an angel. You never turn into an angel, and you never turn into a, into a sub-god or a demigod or god or anything like that. You don't join the ultimate spark. You don't do any of that nonsense. You are uniquely you. You are just without sin. Okay? All right? Um, but you will have things to do. God gave you a creative spirit, made you with a creative spirit. Why would you take away that creative spirit? There will be an entire new earth in which you can venture on. There will be an entire new heaven in which you can venture through. God's presence will be everywhere. You will not grow hungry. You will not grow thirsty. You will not need to sleep. You will not be... None of those things will, will be a thing. Okay? That's what heaven and the new earth will be like. It's going to be something that's, that's a new adventure every the longer it goes on. There won't be days like you think of it. Time, as you know, it will not exist. Um, God, there won't, won't there won't be the need for sun and moon and that kind of nonsense because God will be the light. It says that then in Revelation... It's just so much farther beyond what we know and experience. So, once again, um, try not to associate new heavens and new earth with bad things. It's supposed to be a good thing. Positive thoughts. I'm sorry, let me leave that up. Any questions then on that? No? Did everybody get, get to write whatever down they wanted to? Okay, all right. As we struggle in life, lose family and friends, and endure pain, we have a hope to look forward to. The life we've been known isn't even the tip of the iceberg. Have you ever heard somebody say it's just the tip of the iceberg? It's not even the tip of the iceberg. We have yet to find the iceberg. Okay. So remember that as you as you lose family, as you lose friends, as, as life gets hard, remember that. This isn't even the tip of the iceberg. Okay. So, the question of the week, what doctrines do you think aren't important and why? Things that you just think could just be left out and totally fine. Or do you think all doctrines are equally important? Really want you guys to think about this and, and, give, and give me your honest answers. So obviously next week we'll be talking about unnecessary doctrines. Any questions on anything we talked about or on any 